Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Law Library. Welcome to our library lunch book talks. A um, couple things I just want to business matters to get out of the way before we begin. I first want to thank the dean's office for providing this lovely lunch for us. Um, the book, uh, Nudging Health, Health Law and Behavioral Economics, is for sale in the corner of the room, so if you'd like to buy a copy. Um, some of our contributors will be on hand after the book talk to sign books for you. Um, and I also want to just bring your attention to the fact that we are recording this book talk. It'll be available on the um, Law School YouTube page probably next week. Um, both the panelist presentations and the question and answer section will be recorded. Um, to get us started, it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce um, Holly Fernandez Lynch, who's the executive director of the Petri Floam Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics, which is a mouthful when you're introducing yourself. <laughs> um, Holly is one of the editors of this book. She's going to get us started and introduce us to the rest of our panel. So I hope you enjoy the panel today. Thanks, Holly. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I'm just going to say a few introductory remarks before turning things over to the panel. Um, I am Holly Fernandez Lynch. Uh, I also am joined by Glenn Cohen, who is a professor here at the law school and faculty director of the Petrie Flom Center, my co-editor on this book. Not here today is our third co-editor, Chris Robertson, who some of you may know because he was visiting here and is an alum of this law school. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Cass Sunstein, who is the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard, the former administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy here at HLS, and the prolific author of many works on behavioral economics and regulation, including Nudge, which many of you are probably familiar with, with Richard Thaler. Cass wrote the foreword to our volume. And even though Cass was involved with our book, we didn't get a cute little elephant on our cover. We have you know, kind of the, the 70s kitchen colors on, on our cover over here. Next, we're joined by Jerry Avorn, who is a professor of medicine at HMS and chief of the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics. I love introducing Jerry because that's a worse name than the Petrie Flom Center. It's more of a mouthful <laughs> um, over in the Department of Medicine at the Brigham Hospital. Uh, Jerry and his co-authors contributed a chapter to our volume addressing the use of behavioral economics to promote physicians prescribing of generic drugs and follow-on biologics as a potential cost-saving measure. Last and certainly not least, we're joined by Abby Moncrief, who is the Peter Paul Career Development Professor at Boston University School of Law and alumnus of the Petrie Flom Center's Academic Fellowship. Abby and her co-author contributed a chapter called Measuring the Welfare Effects of Nudge, a Different Approach to Evaluating the Individual Mandate as Part of the Affordable Care Act. So that's who we have here today. This is the book we are here to discuss. And you can see you know, our, lovely, our lovely colors on the, on the cover. The contents of the book, I just want to go through briefly to situate the discussion that's about to take place. So the book is comprised of 24 chapters written by 45 experts in behavioral science and health policy from a range of different disciplines and um, situated in a range of different contexts from academia to government and private industry. So the book begins with an introductory section that basically gives some examples of how nudges have been used in health policy. Then in part one, we move on to an important question about the ethics of nudging generally, and in particular, whether it's appropriate or maybe even ethically obligatory to nudge in the healthcare sphere. Then we move on to discuss approaches to nudging in the context of public health interventions, for example, encouraging, encouraging vaccination, um, me mechanisms of preventing obesity and food policy and the like. The next section goes on to discuss nudging as a mechanism to address healthcare costs, for example, by giving patients some skin in the game with regard to cost sharing or nudging physicians to prescribe cheaper medicines. Then we move on to assess situations in which nudges might backfire in the healthcare space. So for example, when it's possible that incentives might crowd out other motivations for healthy or health-promoting behaviors. 
The next two sections focus on patients, first discussing whether and how doctors ought to nudge their patients, and then whether and in what context patients ought to be left to their own devices, when they might be nudged, and potentially when they ought to be shoved, right, in a more paternalistic approach. And finally, the volume ends with the discussion of examples of defaults in the healthcare space, particularly in the context of organ donation and how changing defaults might effectuate desired change. The goals of the book, generally speaking, are to discuss whether, how, and in what contexts the tools of behavioral science can effectively improve health outcomes, but particularly for our audience and contributors, we wanted to hone in on some philosophical questions, legal limits, and conceptual questions. And with that, I'll turn things over to Glenn and our panelists. Thanks very much, Holly, and thank you all for being here. I'll also mention that Abby is going to be joining us in the spring teaching the basic health law class here at the law school. So if you like what she has to say, think about enrolling in the class. Um, I also want to just give a shout out. I don't think any of them are here because they've all graduated. So the RAs who helped us um, edit the book, uh, we're really, really grateful for the thanks and the acknowledgement. And they've all now off to great legal careers, but we really couldn't have done it without them. So I'm going to start, uh, Cass, with a question for you. And by the way, the format is I have some prepared questions. But we're going to leave time for questions from you from the audience. And will we have a traveling mic for the questions from the audience? We'll figure that out between now and then. Uh, but if you do ask a question, you will be recorded. So know that you're consenting to that. Um, Cass, the term nudge, you are the popularizer or the coiner in chief of this term. Uh, maybe that's giving you some heartburn. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. But I'm curious about what the term means in the context of health, whether you think about it differently in health. And also, I'm curious about the pol politics and the kind of the appropriation of the term whether you think that there are misuses of people have you tried to use the term nudge in the healthcare context in particular, that you say actually that's not a nudge, it's something else. So just talk a little bit about the term if you don't mind. Okay, so uh, the idea which uh, Richard Thaler and I spent a few years on is that the toolbox of private and public institutions uh, should include uh, choice preserving approaches that can sometimes have a very large impact, uh, but that don't require anything or impose material incentives. So a defining example of a nudge is a GPS device, which helps people get in the direction that they want to go. Um, if you want to ignore the device, uh, go for it. Um, but it actually gives you, if the GPS device is good, uh, accurate guidance and doctors often operate as GPS devices they help people navigate a health situation and uh, they tell them that this is the the preferred route though they'll give them other routes too and typically patients can go the direction they want uh, in the domain of health uh, nudges predated the term. Uh, health insurance companies nudge, the Surgeon General nudges, the Department of Health and Human Services certainly nudges, and you don't need the Affordable Care Act to do that. Uh, anyone involved in actual medical care is nudging, uh, if only by framing certain problems in certain ways. So it's pervasive, and I'd say it's less wonderful, though it can be wonderful, than inevitable that there's going to be nudging. Uh, the trick, as I see it, is to figure out ways of usually preserving freedom of choice that can give people longer and healthier lives. Uh, in the healthcare area, it seems to me of international imperative, <coughs> of national and international imperatives for the next generation. Health nudges are really very high. Uh, the Ebola crisis was averted in the recent past, and uh, the averting happened in significant part through nudges. So this is a, not only an inevitable tool, but a potentially very impactful tool. Uh, in my work in the federal government, both the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC were pervasively engaged as they now are in nudging, and uh, thank, thank goodness for that. 
I, I, I'm not so worried about misuse of the term uh, of the problems that ail America today. The misuse of the term nudging <laughs> seems to me less troublesome than the uh, failure to have uh, sufficient ingenuity and creativity and determination in the use of successful nudges. Uh, but the term is sometimes misused. So taxes and incentives are sometimes characterized as nudges. Subsidies are sometimes characterized as nudges. Uh, there's nothing horrible about you know, using a term in a way that's different from uh, previous uses of the term, but it probably helps clarity to say that there are tools like taxes <coughs> and incentives and, and subsidies that are really important and part of the repertoire of any uh, system of choice architecture, but they, but they aren't, they aren't nudges. And uh, nudges have sometimes limitations, but they have some uh, tremendous virtues in their respect for private autonomy. Wonderful. Um, so Cass, I would love to hear a little bit more about Ebola specifically in a moment, but let me open it up to the broader panel to say, do you want to talk about some places where you feel nudges have worked, places where they haven't worked, and whether you think in healthcare there are some lessons to be learned about the success stories versus the failures? I'd be curious about all three of your views on this. So whoever wants to start, we'll start from Abby. Um, okay, I'm, I'm happy to start. So I, you know, I think um, most of the nudges that I think are most powerful in the healthcare sector, um, if we exclude taxes and incentives, which, you know, which I think are a big part of it from the government, but um, uh, a big part of direction of behavior from the government. Um, most of them are, are private, I would say. So, uh, you know, so I think uh, the unions and employers automatically enrolling their members or their employees in health, uh, health insurance plans, um, or, or at least Providing that the the easy enrollment opportunity uh, upon accepting a job is an example. I would think of a of a pure nudge, as Cass defined it, um, where uh, where certainly you could you could you could choose not to. You know, you could say no thanks to the um, to the insurance plan or the policy that's that's offered. Uh, but it would seem it would be a little bit silly too. Um, and uh, and that has been. Well, we, we I, it's all, all of this stuff is always complicated. We could call it a massive success of nudging in the private sector, um, insofar as it has provided insurance for the vast majority of Americans. Um, <coughs> we might dispute whether that's actually a successful approach to insuring Americans or not. Um, but I think that's the biggest example that leaps to my mind. And then there's lots of other sort of little examples of um, you know doctors automatically. Uh, Signing you up for a, a physical one year after you last saw your doctor, and um, and scheduling that, and then of course you can choose to cancel your appointment, but you have that appointment on the books, and they'll call you and remind you that your appointment is coming up, and things like that. Uh, we now have automatic refills on prescription medications to try to keep you on prescriptions that um, are for chronic conditions, things like that that uh, that set defaults or that provide information in ways that um, that lead people to continue with. Um, medical care in, in ways that are probably pretty good. Uh, there are lots, how, all of that said, there are lots of examples of where I think there's room for improvement and in terms of shifting the defaults so that we have what we would call opt-out default <coughs> rules instead of opt-in default rules. There are lots of places now where we have opt-in, where we have an opt-in default rule um, and, uh, and so you sort of start out your life or your trajectory without some particular good and in order to get it you have to sign up for it. So um, uh, Medicaid is an example of an opt-in default rule that, uh, that where government, I think, could actually improve lots of lives by changing it to an opt-out default, by saying that if you're born at a certain, um, you know, if you're born in a hospital and uh, your parents are eligible for Medicaid, but are not participating in Medicaid, or if you somehow encounter the system in some way where it becomes apparent to the state that you are eligible for Medicaid but you're not enrolled, the government could theoretically automatically enroll you and, uh, and then say, if you don't want this service, you can opt out, but uh, otherwise, here we are, you, you have it. Um, and, uh, and similarly, anyone who doesn't have a primary care physician has to sign up for one. Um, theoretically, it would be possible whenever you encountered the healthcare system for the government to say, 
we're assigning you to a primary care physician. There have been a few counties in Texas I know that have um, taken patients who show up at the emergency room for non-emergent conditions and said, uh, well, we, you know, this is a very costly place for you to receive care. We're going to sign you up for a primary care physician that we know is accepting patients. And then um, if you have a problem from now on, you can call that physician. And of course, that's, op uh, you know, that, that switches the default to an opt-out um, system. So there are lots and lots of examples like this where um, the private sector has been actively engaging in nudges and has innovated lots of nudges that have tried to keep people on um, good healthcare trajectories. I think the government has done less of it, and I think there's lots of room for places where uh, public providers and, um, and public payers could leverage nudges more um, and, uh, and, and switch defaults or provide more information in ways that would work. All of that with due respect to, I think Cass gave some examples of CDC and HHS doing some of the nudging also. I probably talked well over my time, but that's <laughs> Joe, do you want to say anything? Sure. Um, our group at the med school has a particular interest in how docs make uh, prescribing decisions about meds. And it's not just about which drug, but also whether to use a drug, what dose to use, and so forth. And although physicians tend to think of ourselves as omniscient, we do sometimes respond to advice. And the more transparent and user-friendly that advice is, the better it works. And so the piece in, our, in the book uh, where most of the, the good work was done by Aaron Kesselheim and Amit Sarpatwari and Natish Chowdhury in my division, um, with a little help from me, looked at nudge, using nudges to improve physician prescribing around generics and biosimilars. And for the most part, this is um, a very useful and, and potentially exciting use of nudging. And of course, the principle applies not just to ordering drugs, but also ordering tests, ordering consults, following up on abnormal tests, and so forth. When you consider the volume of information the doctors have to handle in the course of a given day, both in terms of individual patient information, but also in terms of knowing the database that is evolving really kind of hourly out there about what the right thing to do is, it is a welcome thing to be able to have uh, a well-programmed computer, let's say, and I'll come back to that in a second, um, saying, gee, this patient is, um, is over age X and they need this kind of preventive care and I notice they've got hypertension and it's not adequately controlled. For the most part, we are open to that kind of help because there are so many bazillions of details to try to keep track of both about individual patients and about the knowledge base as it evolves. I think there's only two caveats that I would throw out there and then I'll, I'll quiet down. One is about who owns that real estate of the nudging, that is, uh, given that we have about a $300 plus billion dollar drug industry, um, what entities get to put those little default reminders about, gee, this is a good blood pressure med to use, or this patient ought to be on this statin for their cholesterol, is that going to be done by a uh, neutral body with no commercial ties? Is it going to be a uh, sponsored message that might be brought to you by uh, our friends at Merck or Lilly or Pfizer? So that's one important question. And then the other, the last point I wanted to raise uh, as, as a caveat is I grew up in a household where people spoke uh, Yiddish as well as English, and the term nudge comes to mind <laughs> um, when I hear the word nudge. And for those of you familiar or who are from New York where everyone speaks some version of this, um, nudge is kind of the negative uh, pain on the ass version of nudge. And I think as we deploy nudging in relation to physician decision making, it becomes important that it not become nudging, as in annoying, harassing, uh, get out of my face kind of reminders, which are multiplying exponentially in healthcare. And it's going to be a very artful thing to try to figure out how to have good nudges that are nudges that are science-based, evidence-based, and and not biased toward any particular commercial direction, and at the same time not be nudgy to the point where doctors just hit return as many times as they need to to get the alerts to go away. OK, I'll give three examples from the government side. Um, <coughs> over 400,000 Americans die every year as a result of cigarette smoking. I won't ask people to raise their hand if you know someone who's died from cigarette smoking, but uh, I know too. And I bet most people here in some way know someone who's died through all smoking. Um, the head of the CDC for the last eight years, a kind of hero is named Tom Frieden from New York. He worked for Mayor Bloomberg. 
he knows a lot of behavioral science, and with respect to cigarette smoking, there have been graphic warnings and informational strategies that are nudges over the last years and before, and uh, the data suggests they've had a significant effect, not just in the United States, but all over the world. So many thousands of people are alive today as a result of uh, warnings and information disclosure with respect to tobacco use. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has a provision, we'll see if it stands, probably will, that's my guess, involving uh, calorie labels at chain restaurants and, uh, and similar food establishments. Uh, the data suggests that that nudge, calorie labels, is having a very significant effect on obese and morbidly obese adults. So the problem of adult obesity in the United States, a serious problem, is lower than it would otherwise be because of this intervention. And if the thing goes forward, uh, we're likely to see um, very significant effects. I was recently in Europe where the attention to uses of choice architecture to try to combat uh, adult obesity is uh, uh, intense. And uh, we're already seeing results in the United States. We're going to see them worldwide. Uh, there's one uh, uh, behaviorally informed intervention, the food plate, which has replaced the unintelligible food pyramid. And uh, so far as I'm aware, analysis of the effects of the food plate remains in its preliminary state. The food plate was designed uh, with direct reference to behavioral findings. It is a nudge. And the food plate is everywhere. It's gone viral. Uh, it would be extremely interesting to see in the fullness of time uh, what we can learn about the effects on childhood obesity. But there is uh, some, some very recent evidence suggesting that for the first time in a long time, there's actually progress with respect to childhood obesity. And there's little doubt that the progress that's been observed is um, uh, connected, at least in some part, with the First Lady's Let's Move campaign, which has uh, a host of choice-preserving, uh, nudge-like uh, ideas in it. Great. So now we're going to turn to a question that's covered in the book quite well about the ethics of nudging and normative questions. And I'm curious about the whole panel, but Cass, let me start with you. So one of the big problems if you're a Cass Sunstein fan is he's just so darn productive that if you actually you know, go away for a week, there's a new book you're supposed to read, right? So I'm going to ask you about something that's covered in some depth in one of your other books as well, Cass, uh, and that is Darth Vader's insurance plan. No, not, Darth, not that book, right? It's a book on the world according to Star Wars, right? Would the Affordable Care Act be the law of the empire? or the law of the rebellion could be an interesting uh, quiz question. Or if he was on, no, wait, wait, don't tell me. But uh, instead, I want to ask about the ethics of nudging and why nudging and that kind of stuff. And in particular, I want to ask, in your view, if something is a nudge, by definition, is it ethically appropriate for government to do? Or are there categories of nudging that are, by definition, still nudges that are inappropriate? And in particular, I'm kind of curious about uh, cases where nudges have distributional effects, so where everybody levels up and some people level up more than other people, okay, all for the better. But if we have nudges that have differential impacts on kind of identifiable groups, uh, is there any claim to the ethics of the status quo baseline or is that just a baseline problem? So start with Casper, I'm curious what the other two think. Okay, that, that's great. So uh, uh, in terms of the ethics of what government does, I think that our, our, our good focus is on coercion because uh, to deny freedom of choice is a uh, pretty aggressive thing. It can have effects on welfare as well as autonomy. So I think that would be the principal avenue uh, for ethical contestation. Uh, there are three categories of nudges that raise serious ethical problems. Uh, one are nudges that are inconsistent with the interests or the values of most choosers. Uh, so you could imagine a nudge that would uh, promote unhealthy behavior. In fact, you can find them easily today on television or at the grocery store. That's a, there's an ethical problem with that. Uh, inconsistent with the interests or values of most users. A default rule that is designed to promote the interests of the provider, let's say, 
unethical. Uh, if you have a default rule or any other kind of nudge, that whether or not it's in the interests or values of the choosers, it's founded on some kind of illicit end, uh, then it's no good by definition. So if it shows some sort of uh, favoritism towards one or another group that's related to the distributional problem, unethical. There's a third category of nudges that are problematic independent of this, and those are things that are manipulative. The category of manipulation deserves a lot of attention, but let's say as a kind of uh, quick and dirty account, if there's an intervention that gets people to do something without appealing sufficiently or engaging enough their own capacity for deliberation and agency, if it bypasses that stuff, uh, then there's a question about whether it's treating people respectfully, and that, that would be a problem. Uh, with respect to distributional, completely. So the first criterion of a good nudge is, the, it's not sufficient, but it's the first criterion, is it promote the welfare of the people who are subject to it, like a GPS does. That survives, unless it's a cruel or mischievous GPS, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it survives the welfare test. Uh, but if you have something that promotes aggregate welfare <clears throat> while hurting an identifiable group, uh, that's not so good. And the first remedy would be to refine the nudge so that it doesn't have that adverse effect. Great. Abby, I'm going to throw a question to you now, which is about the stickiness of defaults in American healthcare. So, one way to tell the story about American healthcare and the way it intersects the law is one of constantly adding things on, believing vestigial parts. So, you might say the makeup of uh, the American healthcare system is all tailbone, just a few other kinds of flesh, right? It's things that are left over. I'm curious what you think about parts of the American healthcare system that are heavily defaults and how those defaults are set, both in terms of descriptively, but also the political economy about how the defaults get set. Yeah, uh, that's a big question. So, um, so right, the, the, um, there's a sort of common joke among health law professors that the, or I'm not sure if it's a joke or not, but that the American healthcare system is not a system, it's you know a non-system, the, the American healthcare non-system um, we sometimes refer to in class. And the reason for that is that the, because of the political economy of healthcare, the, the legal structure surrounding healthcare has grown up in this kind of ridiculous piecemeal series of historical accidents. So, uh, so the, the tax break for employer-sponsored insurance was not something that we ever intentionally chose. It was something that we, uh, that, that just arose in to try to combat wage inflation during World War II and wasn't really supposed to be targeted to health care or health insurance at all. Um, and that was kind of the start of this long trajectory towards Obamacare, which was itself just a gap-filling measure to try to take this piecemeal mess and plug the holes in it. Um, so the, the, the question of what's sticky in healthcare is, is I think pretty much everything. <laughs> you make a choice and create an entitlement um, or a, a program um, about how health insurance is gonna be provided or how healthcare is gonna be regulated and then that those things become very difficult to repeal. Um, we'll see whether President Trump will be more successful than others in, in repealing um, and the current Republican Congress. Um, and I, you know, in part, this is because of the filibuster, which um, makes it difficult to, to really repeal. And, and in his 60 minute interview, 60 minutes interview, the president-elect indicated that he probably wouldn't push for a full repeal with the filibuster. Uh, with, by nuking the filibuster, he would probably just try to use a circumventing process to get rid of the things he could. So anyway, these things are very, very sticky. So, um, so and, and, I, and I think part of what's sticky about it, too, is even within the private sector, once you've signed up for a health insurance product or a health insurance plan, if it's basically kind of working for you and not bankrupting you, you're likely to stick with it because switching costs are very high. Researching and understanding health insurance is extremely expensive. Um, so even if we set aside all of the political economy problems with the growth of the of the healthcare of healthcare law and healthcare policy and how sticky those things are, even within the private sector, once you've committed to a certain kind of um, health insurance product, it's hard to, to, 
to switch and to choose. And then also because these things are tied to employment, it can be very hard to switch um, uh, without changing jobs or um, changing states. And then because it's uh, health insurance products are state specific, it can be very hard to choose. Um, so there are lots of reasons to think that people, even with supposedly free choice, end up kind of stuck in a rut in terms of what they do with their um, access to medical care. Changing doctors is expensive, changing health insurance products is expensive. And, um, and so once you're in a, on a particular path, people tend to stay there um, unless they move states or move jobs um, or both. Uh, the, I think the same thing could probably be said of nutrition. I, I think changing habits with respect to food and exercise and wellness, um, those things are also quite expensive, especially because bodies react to certain diets and, and exercise routines. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I think probably as we talk about designing choice architecture most intelligently for um, for American health and well-being over the long term, it seems to me to be crucial to target infancy, to target children at a very young age, and to think about ways that we can try to create uh, good habits for people from a very young age, and which is why I mentioned. In, automatic enrollment in Medicaid at, at birth and things like that to try to get kids on a, a sort of lifelong habit of eating well, going to doctors, having well visits, and being well taken care of um, because these things can be very hard to reverse. So yes, defaults are very, very sticky in healthcare. I think that's the punchline. <laughs> I'll add, by the way, anybody other staff members, we're in the middle of open enrollment at Harvard, but I have to say shout out to the Harvard Benefits Office. They have this amazing tool which has like a slightly clippy, you'll remember clippy, who I did not love, like person popping up and asking you questions. This is actually the best thing I've ever seen in choosing benefits. So even just for fun, I would suggest logging on and making the link available. It was amazing. Um, Jer Jerry, something else that is amazing, for the transition, right, mm -hmm. is the doctor-patient relationship. It's something special, right? It's a fiduciary relationship. We think about it very carefully. I'm curious how you think the implementation of nudges might alter the doctor-patient relationship and whether that's problematic or not. And also more generally, who you think are appropriate <coughs> targets for nudges and beneficiaries of nudges. So you kind of raise the specter that the people who can invest in behavioral sciences will be large pharmaceutical companies working to get us to prescribe their products more, not the struggling public health agencies. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. And are you thinking, Glenn, primarily of, of nudges applied to doctors or nudges applied to patients? Let's, you know, I'm curious about either, but you want to start with either is good for me. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, nudges applied to doctors, uh, it's interesting. When Cass was talking, um, it, the examples were primarily um, from the context of governments that want the best for the people and how, what one can do to improve diet, reduce obesity, and all the other good examples he gave. As in healthcare, we move into a world in which, uh, as of apparently last week, we're going to have less and less government involvement and more probably private sector involvement in the um, conception and delivery of healthcare um, systems. One needs to. Uh, one cannot assume that uh, you know everybody is going to be a Tom Friedman and only wants the best health for the most people, but rather what might be the incentives that would be behind the nudges that a healthcare system might put into place. And uh, even when we have a not-for-profit healthcare system like the various Harvard-affiliated hospitals, they too have their own interests and agendas. And uh, usually, thankfully, these are about patient health. But um, one can envision that they may diverge a little bit from um, the needs of the patient and may speak to more bottom line considerations, especially as more and more healthcare systems worry about you know what the, the their fiscal health is going to be. So I guess question one is, uh, how do we think about nudging in healthcare to doctors uh, that comes from a source that is not the government, even if it is a wonderful, benevolent, not-for-profit uh, teaching institution? And I guess there really are no constraints on that in that uh, unless one breaks the law, and there is not that much law in this area that I'm aware of, uh, it, it is going to be what it is going to be. But I do think that, that it will be an important thing to keep an eye on is there a divergence between the patient's benefit and whatever medical-related nudges are given either to the patient's doctor, as in use this drug because we're getting a break on the price, which may be perfectly okay, um, or to the patient directly. But it's, it's not quite 
as morally clear as people should be less obese. We're in the law school, so I want to ask a question about lawyers and how they, what role they have to play. And let me throw out one example that I'm curious what you think about, but I want, you know, especially Cass and Abby to speak a little bit more generally about what role lawyers have. So something I'm interested in is actually um, predictive analytics, mobile health, kind of big data technologies guiding physicians. And one thing I've heard from physicians is, gosh, the ventilator or whatever piece of technology I have already beeps 37 times in a day, and I have to push the ignore button 37 times because it's generally good for the general patient, but it's not tailored and I know what I'm doing. And I've often said to them, in a malpractice case, can you imagine the question from the plaintiff's lawyer? So, uh, doctor, you're telling me you had 37 opportunities to save this patient's life, and you forewent all of those 37 opportunities, right? So I'm kind of curious whether you, how doctors from a liability stance, but more generally how lawyers you see being involved in the intersection of healthcare and nudging, what your thoughts are. That's a, that's a great large question. So. Uh, one thing is that as uh, behaviorally informed approaches become familiar to lawyers, uh, their own creativity at working with doctors and health providers of multiple kinds uh, to help them do their jobs better will increase. So one thought uh, that the UK Behavioral Insights team uses is uh, make it easy. Whenever you're stuck, make it easy. And that's a good thing to tell, to help doctors so that they can do their jobs and to help patients so they can take care of themselves. On the liability side, I do think that those involved in the day-to-day -day practice of law and those who are involved in law reform have a lot of work to do to, uh, to take it easy on the malpractice idea that the proliferation of um, of practices which are designed to fend off that lawsuit uh, is very frequently not in patients' interests. So there's a chapter actually of Nudge that uh, uh, favors uh, contractual arrangements by which patients can waive their rights to sue. It's kind of not been the most celebrated chapter of the book, uh, but uh, I don't stand by every chapter of the book. I do stand by that chapter of the book. Um, so lawyers, it may not be in their self-interest always to uh, back off of malpractice threats. There's a kind of collective action problem in a way for uh, lawyers and doctors together, but uh, it would be in the public interest. I have one legal and one uh, behavioral science thought about uh, this alert fatigue issue. The legal one is that my colleague Mike Fisher in our division was interested in uh, although we didn't know enough to call it nudging at the time, but whether feedback to doctors about their patients are not filling the prescriptions they wrote would be a useful thing to let doctors know about, because as some of you may know, about 50% of meds for chronic illness go unfilled, and then people go on to have strokes, heart attacks, and break their hips, and so forth. And so the idea that Mike was interested in was, since we know whenever a prescription is filled, might it be useful to systematically let a doctor know right at the beginning of the next visit, you're about to see Mrs. Jones, she hasn't taken her drugs for osteoporosis in a year and a half, and she had a hip fracture already, and maybe you'd like to talk to her about it. And the legal piece of this that I found astonishing and depressing was that the response of a lot of doctors was, I would have thought as a primary care doctor myself for a lot of years, that would be great information. I'd love to have a big red sticker on the front of the chart or a big alert on the computer screen when Mrs. Jones came in for her visit. Most doctors said, no, I don't want to hear about that because it could present me with another liability challenge that when she does go on to have her fairly predictable next hip fracture, uh, a lawyer might come in saying, Dr. Abram, didn't you get a notice that she wasn't taking her medicines and what did you do about it? So the fear that a nudge could put a doctor in an adverse situation by providing him or her with more information than they want to handle was disappointing and scary. The behavioral science piece about alert fatigue is one, and maybe we should be having this talk over in William James Hall, is we, we could in medicine learn a lot from the airline industry about um, nudges and alerts. And I am told by people who study that is that years and years ago, uh, it was figured out that if you have a pilot in a 747 cockpit, and there are 43 million different signals and lights and buzzers coming at 
him or her, then they end up ignoring all of them and you cannot draw their attention to the one that says the fuel tank is empty or you're losing altitude because there's all these other things that are out there flashing. And one of the things people have thought about in translating nudges in a good way to healthcare, often with very little success, is how do you identify this patient? In fact, we had a tragic case of Dana-Farber many years ago of a woman who unfortunately, I mean, tragic for anyone, but she also happened to have been a Globe Health reporter, um, was given a many, many orders of magnitude um, excessive highly high dose of her chemotherapy because there were too many zeros on the dosage and it killed her. And so the question is, how do you direct attention to that without having a lot of other silly things that pop up on the computer where at the Brigham we have found that the house officers who are always very busy doing a million things just keep hitting return, 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 return until the alerts go away. So the human interface question of how do we help filter that and make it useful instead of a distraction is, um, is a key challenge for implementing this in healthcare. And I'll just end with one anecdote of when, when Mike Fisher and I were trying to help program the Brigham computers to give people usable nudge-like information. Um, we often found that they were just hitting return, return until the notices went away. And we put in a program that asked them, can you please explain to us why you were just ignoring that message? And the most common response we got back was, because I'm a doctor and you're a computer. <laughs> so we do need to figure out the human interface <laughs> to, make this, to make this work better in healthcare. Uh, so I, I want to, I want to just, I want to combine Cass's, one of Cass's three examples of unethical nudges with Jerry's response on the patient uh, doctor relationship to mention one caveat to the skepticism towards malpractice <laughs> that has come up, which is that we, you know, we talk about um, the, or, or Cass talked about how it would be unethical to use nudges that are in the interest of the provider rather than in the interest of the user. And, uh, and Jerry talked about examples like pushing or um, advertising prescription drugs or other kinds of drugs of particular kinds and having doctors default to those drugs that are best known or have been, you know, where the uh, sellers have taken the doctor out to lunch or what have you. These are known problems. Um, and I'm sure there are countless others that, that are involved in the, in the patient, uh, the physician patient relationship. Things like that, I think, are things that have been um, entirely off the radar of medical malpractice. It's not an area that law has come into play much, where if a patient has a bad reaction to a drug and it turns out that the physician has, you know, has had lunch with the drugs manufacturer countless times, or, uh, that's not a, a cause for a medical malpractice suit today. Um, it could be, or it could be um, maybe something other than malpractice. Not necessarily doesn't necessarily need to be tort, um, but uh, but it could be a place that the law could intervene to say there are nudges happening from on the physician side that are causing the physician to treat patients in ways that are not solely in the patient's best interest, and are instead you know you could you could come up with a conflict of interest story um, that that could be a place for the law to intervene. Um, again, maybe not through tort, maybe contracts waiving liability would be fine. I'm not taking a position on that, but just um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, so, but something that the law could have something to say about to try to eliminate some of the uh, nudges that exist for physicians that may not be in the best interest of the patients. Great. Well, hopefully we've nudged you towards curiosity because we have a time. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of bad puns. There, we have time for audience questions. And I think we're going to have a microphone moving around. So if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. And we'll bring you the microphone in turn. This gentleman over here, you can start, sir. We'll just wait for the microphone to arrive so that we record your thoughts as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Helfer, law school retired. <clears throat> Prof uh, excuse me, uh, Professor Avorn, is that the correct that's right. pronunciation? Yes, that's right. Uh, you spoke of the government wanting only the best for its citizens, uh, but the history of public health in the United States is not without its uh, negative aspects. I mean, we had about 30 or 40 years of forced sterilizations. Uh, we had the Tuskegee experiments going into the 70s. Uh, there was a lot of uh, experimentation on foster children with AIDS drugs. These were uh, this was all done by uh, public health officials uh, for the government. Uh, my question is, uh, does the public health profession, is it good at policing itself? 
uh, to stop uh, what could be abuse of individual liberties and unethical aspects. And if the public health profession is not good at policing itself, is there any other uh, body that we could look forward to make sure it doesn't become excessive? Okay, fair point. Uh, I think that in 2016, one can make a reasonable argument that in, in part because of those tragedies and travesties that you mentioned, there is a pretty high level of sensitivity on the part of, of, of all the players in, in public health and in medical research um, of trying very hard to not ever let those things happen again. I'm sure that there will be instances that escape that scrutiny, um, but for the most part, I think that in healthcare, we've learned a lot from those horrible instances, and uh, to say it as uh, conservatively as I can, we don't do it hardly at all anymore. Um, I think the, the fear that I have right now is that the biggest threat to the misuse of nudging in healthcare won't be coming from public health authorities or from um, the government as much as it might come from private healthcare organizations um, that are under a lot of fiscal pressure. But I, I don't deny those experiences, but they are for the most part uh, in the past, and I think we've learned a lot from them. We have another question. Yes, up here in the front, please. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if the panel could differentiate between uh, patients. Uh, patients are not all created equal. They come with different information bases, biases, misinformation that they've received from the outside world into the doctor's office and, uh, or into the health care system. And at some level, a nudge is a, a necessary manipulation, I guess, or felt to be so by the authority. And on the other hand, uh, the patient may experience this as an, an intrusion in their right to believe that uh, uh, abortions are, uh, you know, the death of, uh, of living full persons with constitutional rights. Thank you. Yeah, I could say a little bit about that. So I'm not sure whether um, we'd see nudges as a necessary manipulation. Uh, here are six nudges. Information, reminders, warnings, active choosing, invocation of the social norm, and use of defaults. Uh, if a patient is told you go this way, that's, uh, you know, most people are fine after 10 years, but 20% not so much. You go that way, 60% uh, of people are fine, 40% not so much. That, that wouldn't be an intrusion on anybody. If you give people a reminder, you know, you haven't been taking your medicine. I think it would be a very broad definition of intrusion such that that would be one, though it might not be welcome exactly. Uh, a warning that says that, you know, you're uh, X number of pounds overweight and you're at risk of diabetes if you don't do something. Of, of <coughs> intrusions on the human soul, that's, that's a pretty weak one. So the challenge, I think, is to uh, get very particular about the nudge such that it seems like an intrusion. And my hunch is that the ones where the word intrusion or manipulation are justified are ones that are kind of pressing the definition pretty hard, where freedom of choice is being impaired. So if the doctor says, look, the social norm in contexts like yours is to go for chemotherapy. That's what most people do. But it's completely up to you. That's giving a patient information probably useful to have and wouldn't be taken as intrusive. If it said, you know, my practice is to go for chemotherapy here and that's kind of what we're going to do, I don't think most doctors would do that. But that would run afoul of the, the concern about intrusiveness. So, so long as we emphasize that the whole idea of, of nudging is preserving individual autonomy, the risk to, which isn't, isn't always the right thing to do. So as Abby said, taxes and incentives are sometimes a good idea. And if doctor, and your, to your point about heterogeneity, if you're dealing with a patient who's quite clueless about what's in his or her best interests and a little bit intransigent about going the route that's gonna save the life, then to do something that's received as intrusive might be warranted. 
But I, 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 I think that the, the word nudge may be, is, is a little misleading here, especially if it's associated with nudge. But because the, the repertoire of tools, they are, uh, though sometimes astonishingly impactful, they're, they're soft tools. I, you know, I think the, the one area that we haven't talked about yet that I, where I think nudges are starting to be used more that might raise a, a sort of version of your concerns, especially since you mentioned abortion as an example, is in end-of-life care, where there's been a move to educate towards educating patients as they approach the end of life about some of the alternatives between hospitalization with intensive care versus um, hospice and at-home care. Uh, and there have been some video presentations that I've seen as examples of ways to inform patients about what it looks like to have those two alternatives. And um, and although I, I, I think that the videos have been, have been designed to be purely informative, there's no doubt that they portray home care as a better option and a more comfortable option and a superior option to being hospitalized. Um, and, and that option being more painful and, and also costlier. Um, and that might be something that would evoke values for people who believe that because of the, the sanctity of life, every, every measure must be taken to try to prolong life and, and might, put, might present a challenge to a core value that an individual patient holds while other patients may not hold that core value. Um, and, and when it, when that kind of challenge comes up to you know a feeling of being manipulated, even even if the video is intended just to be pure information, it might feel somewhat manipulative to a patient who feels that the information is at odds with a long-held value or belief. And we're seeing this more and more in in politics that you know that pure information that challenges a core belief starts to look like a lie or a manipulation or you know or something like that. Um, to individual consumers, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm I don't know what to do about that. I'm not sure that there's that there's any way to solve that problem. It, but but I think Cass's point at, in throughout the book and in much of his writing has been that um, we should trust individuals to survive that kind of. Um, felt manipulation so long as the freedom of choice is legitimately preserved and is still there. So if that patient, you know, watches a video saying you might be more comfortable at home, but still is freely allowed to choose the hospital as a place to be for the end of life, then the harm is a, is a fleeting harm of feeling like he or she was sort of pushed in the direction of, um, of being at home when in fact he or she had, a, had the right to be in the hospital and could freely choose to be in the hospital. Um, so I, you know, I think it's it's a it's kind of a touchy question, but I'm not sure that it's a um, or, you know a touchy distinction, I guess, between where freedom really is versus where manipulation really is um, when those kinds of tensions occur. I mean, your question raises a, a really important point about the, especially as nudging becomes more accepted and common as a strategy um, related to healthcare, it raises the possibility of the nefarious use of nudging that is uh, kind of clothed in the um, guise of we are just trying to get patients more information. And in relation to the abortion example you mentioned, I think of the state regs that have popped up here and there that a woman who seeks an abortion must first be obliged to look at an ultrasound of the fetus, which could in a cynical kind of way be presented as, oh, we're just giving the patient more information to inform her decision. But we all know where that's coming from and what it's designed to do. And so I think we do need to be alert to the idea that giving patients information uh, needs to really come from the point of empowering patients and not some other agenda. And then the last thing I wanted to throw out is the, Cass mentioned some examples uh, from oncology, the very difficult challenge of getting both the presentation and the content right when we are trying to let people know about their choices in terms of presentation of information about risks and benefits in language that is intelligible to people, to regular normal humans, which is very, very tough. I mean, we find it very difficult to present risk-benefit information to doctors because most of us are not trained in thinking about 
probabilities of risk versus benefit, number needed to harm, and all, and all of that. And presenting to patients is, at best, just as tough and often tougher. So that's not so much a nefarious agenda issue as much as we have a lot more work ahead of us to say we're going to let the patients know what their options are and remind them about which are the better ones, because just communicating that can be hard. So as the moderator, I get the last word, which is to say, I think one interesting question is, is there a line between the end-of-life example and the abortion ultrasound example that doesn't depend on our priors about whether palliation is the right choice and whether abortion is the right choice? Is there an independent, a neutral principle, if you will, or in fact, is it all based on our base rate assumptions about what the majority of people really would want if they were informed? Like, so I'll leave that hanging. Please join me in thanking this panel. And we will have book sales over there on the left and book signing for a little while too. Thank you very much. And we will have a few other of these books coming out.